This video is part of the Commercial Building Electrical Design Series, looking at special systems, uh, in particular on this video, fire alarm systems, and we'll be talking about initiation devices within those systems. So, looking at uh, fire alarm initiation devices, so beyond the fire alarm control panel and initiation panel, or panels, there are basically two types of devices related to fire alarms. These two categories uh, of devices are the initiating devices and the notification devices. So we want to, uh, during this lecture, take a look at both these categories of devices along with examples of each. <clears throat> so initiation devices are devices that send a signal or status to the fire alarm control panel. So most commonly, uh, the most common use of these is to put the system into some type of alarm to communicate something's going on. So there are several states that a fire alarm control panel uh, can be in which are a uh, general alarm, so this notifies occupants and the fire department uh, that there's a problem. You can have a supervisory alarm, so this requires supervisory interaction, so this does not necessarily uh, uh, contact the fire department. Uh, so an example of this is uh, like in hotels, I've done quite a few hotels, so we'll have smoke detectors all throughout the facility, but we'll also have smoke, smoke detectors in each guest room. So the ones in the corridors uh, in lobby and stuff like that, if they detect smoke, they will put the system in general alarm. Okay, so that means a life safety uh, pathway has been, is potentially obstructed by smoke or fire. If we detect smoke in a guest room, we do not put it in general alarm, but we put it in supervisory alarm. So the reason for this is we always put an enunciator panel right there at the uh, check-in desk. So there should, uh, there has to be someone there 24 hours a day. And so they'll see the supervisory alarm, and that way they can call up to the room or, or walk up there and see if there's actually a problem. Uh, so the reason for this is, you know, it could be somebody in there that's cooked something in the microwave, or if they have a toaster, burnt something, and just caused a little bit of smoke in the room. We don't want to empty the entire hotel just because of that. Uh, and since this is a monitored system, that is, you always have someone at the checkout desk, uh, they can always run to check on that. Uh, and of course, if they see a problem, they can just go to the nearest pull station and pull that, and that'll put the whole system in general alarm. But uh, it kind of just tries to uh, avoid some of the nuisance alarms sometimes that you get in hotels. <clears throat> and then another state that a, a fire alarm control panel can be in is a trouble state. So this indicates that there's a problem with the device. So many of the fire alarm devices are self, have self-diagnostics, so they'll test themselves, and if they don't pass their own test or if they detect a problem or, or some situation that's out of spec, uh, they will send a signal back to the fire alarm control panel and says, hey, you need to come check on me, something's not right. So one of the most common initiating devices is the manual pull station. I mentioned it just a minute ago. So this is, a, there's a picture of one here, you've probably seen them. So this is a device that is located near the egress exits uh, that allows a user to manually notify the fire alarm control panel of a hazardous situation. So we usually put this at the, uh, you know, where you exit the stairwells, near the elevators, uh, all the egress exits. That way, if someone's fleeing the building because of something, they can pull the alarm in case it hasn't been uh, signaled by some other detector to let it know that there's a problem. Um, most fire alarms specified today, the pull stations required uh, dual action. And sometimes you may have seen these, it'll be it'll look like the device here on the screen, but it'll have a clear plastic cover over it. And so you sometimes you have to lift that cover and then pull down. Uh, and so what they'll do, especially like in schools and stuff, they'll make it to where when you lift the cover, that'll uh, set off a local alarm um, that doesn't put the, the fire alarm control panel in any kind of supervisory or general alarm. It just sets off a little alarm there. And then you have to pull down the little lever there to actually put it in general alarm. So the reason for this, again, is to avoid nuisance and stripping, because like at schools, you'll have kids messing around, and a lot of times if you'll just put that local alarm and they pull it up, it scares them enough, they'll put it back down and not, not do anything further. Uh, the next device is a smoke detector. Uh, you've probably seen these around in, in numerous buildings. Um, so this is a device that it, you know we strategically locate throughout a building. Uh, that monitors for the presence of smoke. <clears throat> so the most common place we put these, uh, or, or legally required to put them, is in the path of egress, because uh, you want to make sure that path always stays clear, and if anything does start to obstruct it, um, then we want to notify.
notify the fire alarm and the fire department immediately. Uh, there are different types of smoke detectors. Um, and you can have heat detectors. Some of them will just detect heat and not smoke. So for larger buildings that have larger air handler units, uh, and usually the criteria for that is 2000 CFM or larger, uh, the code actually requires that you put smoke detectors in the return ducts of these larger units. And that's because, you know, as these large units start to move air around, they'll also move the smoke around so you can sample for smoke in those ducts. Um, when you get up to really large units, usually it's in the neighborhood of 10,000 to 15,000 CFM, many code reviewers will uh, require you to put duct detectors in both the return and the supply. Uh, I guess there's opportunity when the when the units are that big that the smoke could actually get through, through the return system or sometimes they'll have outside air systems and then uh, make it through the, the fan motor and then come start to come out the supply. Well, some some cases smoke can, can uh, like I said, get past all these other detectors so you want to monitor it in a couple of places. So you usually put that sampling tube in there in the duct and then the, uh, the plastic, uh, clear plastic case there is usually on the outside where the and samples through that tube in the, uh, in the duckway. Uh, another thing you can do is in, if you have like a, a really high ceiling or if you have like a, uh, a lobby with an atrium or something that, that goes pretty high up and then it's usually in the range of 20 to 30 feet, uh, you'll use these beam detectors. Uh, if you happen to go back into Reed sometime uh, after the COVID thing's over, uh, there's actually beam detectors in there in the high uh, open area there in each corner. You can see them. And so what this does is one device uh, actually shoots a laser beam out, and the other one's just a reflector, so it reflects it back. And so it's constantly shooting that laser out and monitoring to see if it comes back. And if you know a certain amount of it is not reflected back, and that usually indicates that there's some particulate in the air that's causing it not to reflect back, which we assume would be smoke. And so that'll set off the smoke detector. I know the first year I was at Olivet, uh, you know, the building had just been completed and that wasn't aligned properly. And we kept getting false alarms and they finally had to come in and adjust that laser to make sure it was reflecting back properly. So like I said, an alternate to smoke detector is a heat detector. Uh, this device looks almost identical to the smoke detector, but it monitors for heat instead of smoke. Uh, this type of device can be used to monitor for specific fixed temperature thresholds or for special environments. Uh, some devices can monitor for a rate of rise in temperature. So if, you know, if it goes up uh, 20 degrees within five minutes, then there's probably a problem. Um, so that's the way those devices work. And the reason for this is, you know, there's some places where, again, you could have smoke and it not be a problem. So we use smoke detector, uh, heat detectors in kitchens many times because many times just the act of cooking will produce smoke and you don't want those false alarms. We'll also many times put them in closets or in uh, maintenance rooms that uh, could get dirty in there because sometimes dirt on the smoke detector can cause a false alarm too, whereas if it's a heat detector, uh, then that won't bother anything. There's also devices available to monitor for the ultraviolet light that is emitted from flames from a fire. So instead of looking for the heat, it'll look for the, the light signature from the, from the fire, uh, from the flame of the fire that would cause the system to, to go off. One final thing is the fire alarm many times will interact with uh, a sprinkler system if there's a sprinkler system in the building. So one thing you need to be aware of is if uh, you know, the, the system I've been talking about with the fire alarm control panel, the smoke detectors, the pull stations, that is your fire alarm system. A sprinkler system is referred to as a fire protection system. It protects you from fire where the, the fire alarm uh, monitors for fire. So, you know, be careful when you're out in industry, you don't mix those two up because some people do and they'll refer to the fire alarm control panel system as a fire protection system. Well, that's not technically correct and you can confuse a lot of people if you do that. Um, but uh, anyway, we do a few things with, uh, with the sprinkler systems. The device there on the left, you'll see that little circular thing is the paddle, so it detects for flow. 
So, you know, if a head breaks and water starts to flow in the system because, you know, the heat gotten too much and popped the, the cap of the sprinkler head, we'll detect for that water flow. If we detect water flow, then something's obviously gone wrong. So we will put the system in general alarm. And so sometimes if you have sprinkler heads in an area, you don't, you aren't required to have to have smoke detectors there as well because the sprinkler heads can set off the fire alarm just as well as a, as a smoke detector could. Uh, you can also have tamper switches. So once the water is turned on, uh, you know, it has to stay on for the sprinklers to work. There's valves there. So if we put a, a, a tamper flow switch, a tamper switch on that. So if someone does turn the water off, that'll set the system in the alarm or at least into trouble to let them know, hey, you got sprinklers, but there's no water going to them. There's a problem here. We need to fix that. So uh, there's a couple other ways that we interact with the, the sprinkler systems.